The anim starts with a floating fortress that appeared out of nowhere 10,000 meters above the ground, sparking an endless war between humans and monsters. Luckily for humanity, the Dragon Guardians, with their blue, green, pink, yellow, and red rangers, are set to confront the nefarious monster army to put an end to this terrible battle that has become part of the Sunday Weekly Showdown, which has been attracting crowds to its events for 13 years. Despite all their power and prestige, the rangers have to be cautious of the monster army's secret weapon, so they must enter this confrontation without a sense of already won. Speaking of our heroes, the Red Guardian is the first to appear to greet the frenzied fans. As always, the leader of the ranger force is friendly to all seeking an autograph or a photo, and it is to this fantastic man that everyone entrusts the future of humanity, while the monster army gathers its forces in the gigantic floating fortress. At the event entrance, two presenters approach a boy walking down the corridor towards the spectacle telling him that if he's aware of the risks but still wants to watch the show, he should perceive on his own. The boy looks around at the dozens of advertisements and announcements using the Guardian's image and finds this risk warning exaggerated because there haven't been any accidents involving civilians for years. Despite this, the wound informs him that it's protocol to issue this warning, so the young man comments that the two presenters seem too young to be in the Ranger Force. The presenter says that anyone can join them because the Rangers are always looking for fresh blood, while handing him a pamphlet from the organization. The boy looks at the paper with some skepticism, and the girl adds that it's indeed easy to join the team, but being like the Guardians is something completely different. Holding the young man's hand, she says it ultimately depends on him. With the warning given, the young man begins to climb the stairs and crosses the underground passage until he reaches the first district of Amanogawa. The audience is distracted around the stadium until the monster army finally materializes inside the arena with its repugnant forces. At the forefront are the fighters known as Shadows, led by the feared Old Tora Tiger. The crowd boos and curses the enemies as they throw dozens of cans of them until the heroes of the day arrive to the audience's delight. Full of confidence, the Red Guardian announces that this land belongs to humans and he will not allow these monsters to do as they please. Then the Dragon Guardians drive the crowd wild with their classic pose as the fight is about to begin. However, they will have to face the terrible Old Tora, a monster born from all the collective grudges of tigers in this world, who promises to punish the inhabitants of this planet as they deserve. To start, he will make all animals have tiger stripes and will turn this world into absolute chaos. As he instills fear in the attending humans, a monster tiger orders his shadows to attack. A fighter approaches a mother with her young daughter, but Suzukiri manages to prevent the worst with her lightsaber and asks Sakurama to take the spectators to a safe place. With his fury, Altoma shows his power and isolates the red and yellow guardians several meters away. Confidently, he asks if that's all the rangers have to offer, while the red one admits that this is the strongest monster he has ever faced. Not to be outdone, the green one hurls a gigantic rock at the enemy, who can't hold a rock of that size and is crushed by the guardian, who boasts as his image appears on the stadium zeppelin. Despite this, Old Tor returns from the ashes laughing, so everyone realizes that perhaps the guardians need to use the divine artifact to destroy this enemy. Feeling invincible, the monster begins his Tora Tora transformation and turns into a 1990s Mitsubishi mini truck. To face all this power, the rangers embrace each other and form the middle line, gathering strength to face head on a truck at 69 miles per hour. Despite the brilliant strategy, they are all violently thrown around the arena and the crowd, which was once filled with hope, begins to fear for the lives of their heroes. A child shouts for the dragon guardians not to give up, and the red one announces that as long as there is someone to protect, they will rise no matter how many times. With that, the ranger begins an attacking pose and the shadows retreat in fear upon realizing that the divine artifact will be used. One of the fighters advises that they use the classic strategy of returning to the fortress and rebuilding themselves as soon as they fire the dragon detonator, and another is eager for the loser's speech. Altoma is already worried because he didn't rehearse what to say when defeated, but soon the guardians were ready to unleash the dragon's breath. The shadows panic, but Fighter D gets tired of all this pathetic acting and stands in front of the blast. Just at the crucial moment of the fight, the Red Guardian announces the commercials. An hour before the showdown, the monsters were brainstorming in the floating fortress because they had no idea what monster to build for this week. One of them gives up trying and dozes off, while the radio announces that the battle is about to begin. The shadows keep an eye out to see if they can get any ideas to assemble the monster, but nothing useful is being said. On the contrary, the presenter says that the monsters have a secret weapon, which is a lie. Furthermore, she says that this battle has been going on for 13 years, but in reality, the floating fortress was wiped out in the first year along with its leaders, but to serve as actors, the shadows were spared and are alive to this day. At this moment, it's announced that the Red Guardian had already arrived at the stadium, 
So Friedrichy beats his chest and takes on the responsibility of creating the Monster of the Week, a super strong creature with a ripped physique. However, Friedrich says that abstract ideas do not cause a lasting impact, so this monster had to have some kind of theme. With this disagreement, the shadows begin to despair because they're running out of time, so Fighter L asks the guys to calm down and draws a cute kitten to face the rangers, convinced that the audience would love it. However, Fighter A loses his cool and shouts that the monster has to make the children cry in fear to generate a commotion when it is defeated. The artist thinks about creating a lion until Fighter D finally joins the conversation and advises that a tiger be created because, as he heard, tigers and dragons are culturally understood as rivals, and that would be the perfect symbolism to confront the Dragon Guardians. In response, a colleague promises to pull Fighter D's sheet off at bedtime because he is already covered in reason and hopes that the audience will buy into this idea of mortal rivalry, even if they lose every week. Despite this, Fighter D is tired of all this combined defeat story and tries to rally his companions to seek victory this time, otherwise, they will never be able to complete their mission. Looking at each other, the other shadows wonder what mission this could be, and then D reveals that it is to dominate the world because even after the leader's deaths, the goal remains the same. However, despite the fiery speech, his crime partners laugh at all this foolish motivation, emphasizing how it could only be his thing, until the fighter rebels against his colleagues and goes after them. After seeing his colleague beaten up, Fighter F asks D to calm down a bit or he'll end up dying with this madness. However, D is still outraged by all this conformism of the shadows in the face of so much weakly humiliation, even though F believes they lost the moment their leaders were defeated, now they are only instruments of the Guardians and they cannot let the public discover that it's all just a show because that's the condition of the truce. Indignant, D pretends to accept, while the others mobilize to build the tiger with a copy of the animal encyclopedia that the rangers gave them. Fighter Z offers to be the tiger, then visualizes the encyclopedia for inspiration and begins the long transformation into the fake boss. Despite looking like a bodybuilder hyena run over by a tractor, the fighters accept because it's last minute. D comments to F that he would do much better than Z, but he's not on duty today. Moreover, he wouldn't offer to be the boss just to be ridiculously defeated in the end. Then looking at a huge crystal spinning through the air, F recounts that during the last Sunday confrontation, he saw a small surface dweller in front of him, and instead of humiliating the shadow as anyone would do with an enemy, the kid told F to do his best. Upon hearing that, as nonsensical as it sounded, F didn't feel so bad. That day, he realized he doesn't mind losing because his role is to entertain the audience, even if they don't know it's all staged. With this conformist speech, he gets even more irritated, and all this revolt leads to his attitude standing in front of the ranger's shot. After the explosion, the announcer enthusiastically announces that the world has been saved by the Dragon Guardians once again. From within the smoke, he asserts that the shadows are indeed immortal, but they still feel pain, and they are not mere puppets to act as a farce in this ranger show. It's the same thing every week, so Gi would love to bring a different element to this repeated spectacle. Seeing the remaining shadow, the Yellow Guardian comments that it wasn't agreed upon, while the Green One emphasizes how stupid this fighter is for staying there. The pink one tells the shadow to return to the fortress while there's still time, but D is determined to end these fake games. Inside his head, he's conjuring up a powerful and swift attack, but in reality, he's running towards the enemies like a drunken elderly person. In the face of this, the red one steps forward and uses his charm to say that this fighter seems like a formidable opponent because of his audacity. At that moment, D sees the child that F mentioned earlier, and she was encouraging the monster to move forward and do his best. Despite this, the rest of the crowd maintains their usual disdain for the shadows, so he promises to wipe that smile off everyone's faces. However, Guy is brought back to reality the next instant when the Red Ranger says that this is not the stage where this bunch of monsters can shine, and that they should be content with this loser position. Then he cuts the fighter in half, and the other guardians disintegrate him with a cannon. Inside the floating fortress, F counts 999 defeats in 999 battles and notices that D hasn't returned yet. A colleague comments that it's normal for someone to run away from time to time because they can't bear this reality. Meanwhile, he materializes again in another part of the city, this time resigned that the poor shadows are not even capable of being villains, but that doesn't make him give up on ending the enslavement of his peers. During his speech, human skin envelops his body until he takes the form of a boy, and this boy goes to Suzukiri, claiming he wants to see the battlefield from a higher place. The girl agrees that the stadium is a great view and asks what the boy thought of last Sunday's fight. He replies that it was incredible to meet the Guardians up close and that one day he wants to be like them. Therefore, he considers taking the recruitment test. And while Suzukiri comments that he seems excited, he looks up at the sky and promises to exterminate his enemies. 
Sunits explained on the radio that the wave of applause sparked a wave of power within the shadows, so the dragon guardians are more necessary than ever to keep the Earth safe. The shadows, which in turn have a much deeper history than one might imagine. Going back in history, humanity's struggle against the monsters began when the floating fortress appeared, and with their immortal bodies, the monsters attacked mercilessly, that the humans never lost. One year after the start of this bloody war, the divine artifact was created, and with it, the monsters could finally be destroyed, confirming human hegemony in this conflict. Back to the present, the selection of new rangers continues at full steam, and the Red Guardian tries to motivate the candidates to finish the ten laps remaining around the gym. Amidst this, D continues to maintain his disguise while questioning what happened to that taller guy's hair. Looking around, D knows that none of these candidates have any idea that it's all just a performance, but that's not his problem after all, his focus is on going after the five rangers who were present when their masters were decimated that day. After the test, Fighter D goes to the Dragon Guardian's headquarters and asks the receptionist if they are present, but she says they are not. As he was about to ask why, Sakurama approaches from behind the fighter and says he's excited to see that the guy came to take the test, so he's proud to have invited the new colleague. Soon Suzukiri also appears, saying that Sakurama got excited about the new friend's presence, but that doesn't guarantee the guy will pass the tests. However, Sakurama gives D an extra incentive by rubbing his face against his in an inconvenient cuddle, causing cracks in the fighter's fragile and poorly made body and threatening to reveal his disguise. Watching this scene carefully, Suzukiri gives the impression that she noticed something strange, but she just invites the newly formed human to have lunch with them. And with that, Gi thinks the surface dwellers are too naive. Meanwhile, in the floating fortress, the fighters who stayed firm in the staging scheme face off in a classic tic-tac-toe game, until the red and blue guardians arrive in search of the rebellious fighter. The red one tries to reassure the servants saying that everyone is truce partners, but the blue one takes on a more intimidating role, saying the matter is serious because of the betrayal of one of the monsters. The ranger thinks everyone might be involved, but one of them explains that Fighter D decided to act alone. Thus, the blue one orders the rebel to appear, but they explain that D never returned from the last fight. Still, the human thinks the others might be covering up for the dissident, so he plans to make the fighter in front pay for it. But the Red One asserts that everyone present shares the same resentment for the betrayal of Fighter D, who is solely responsible for all this. When the Blue One understands, the Red One adds that the Rangers and the Monsters have been partners for over a decade, so they have taken security measures to prevent such cases from recurring. From now on, Eren Hakiru, from the 3rd Junior rank of the Blue Squadron, and Shinta Ruri, senior of the same squadron, will be on watch inside the Floating Fortress. All the Monsters are shaken and fearful of the decision, but Fighter C decides to rebel against the tyrants because the fortress is theirs and they also deserve privacy. With that, the Blue Ranger destroys his head, which soon regenerates, but the Guardian warns that next time he won't allow the monster to recover. Thus, Fighter A bows to avoid further problems and surrenders on behalf of the other monsters. In view of this, the Red Ranger reminds the subordinates that the weak must listen to the strong and not retaliate. In this way, they have just taken a new step towards world peace, and all those who oppose it will suffer the consequences, paying with their lives just as their masters did on that fateful day. Observing from afar, Fighter F decides he can't act as foolishly as his friend D, and intends to live in dishonor to avoid being killed, but wonders if that's really all he can do in the face of such tyranny. In this interval, Fighter D understood that it was necessary to eat with the fork in the left hand and the knife in the right hand, while Suzukiri explains that the Dragon Guardians usually don't stay in the HQ, but in their respective quarters scattered around the city of Amanagawa because according to Sakurama, the duties of a ranger are not limited to monster extermination but also include cleaning activities and conflict resolution with the police, for example, and for these and other reasons, the population loves the rangers so much. Amidst all this acclaim, he comments that people will hate to know that the fights have always been just a little theater, but soon regrets letting that slip in front of the rangers. However, Suzukuri thinks it's about a video they recently released on the internet challenging the truth of the battles, so T takes on that narrative to cover up his blunder. Still, this way he discovers that the two have no idea about the reality. At this moment, the mother and the boy who were saved in the last event thank the rangers for their act of bravery, while the waiter serves a dessert on the house. Faced with all this recognition, Sakurama comments looking at D that not everyone understands the importance of this organization, but that he is proud to be part of the ranger force. He imagines he must indeed love it because getting good food for free with everyone fawning over you all day shouldn't be that difficult. Then the rangers decide to leave to start the afternoon tasks at the Red Headquarters and D engraves that name in his head. Later, he calls the kid to see the photo the boy took with everyone, looking closely at Sakurama's face, 
While remembering the Red Ranger's words about the monsters being failures, he transforms into the red-haired boy, scaring the child but convincing the waiter, who believes Sakurama is in person. Later, at the Red Squadron headquarters, he tries to fit into his new skin, and tries not to make any mistakes. Keeping calm, he needs to convince the girl to let him deliver the letter personally to the Red Ranger, because then he can use the knife he hides in his bag. After managing to get his hands on the letter, the fake Sakurama waits for Suzukiri to identify herself as a member of the Yellow Squadron to gain entry permission. As the gate opens, Du wonders if he will finally meet the Red Ranger face to face. As he enters, he becomes confused by the multitude of people wearing the same uniform. Therefore, he seeks assistance from his partner. However, a member of the Red Squadron questions who the colorless brat is inside, emphasizing the fact that Sakurama is an independent ranger. D explains that he has matters to discuss with the Red Guardian, and the man claims to be him. Then D prepares to draw his knife, but Suzukiri ruins the moment by revealing that the place is actually Tokita's, veteran of the 3rd Squadron. Tokita responds that this doesn't change the fact that one day he will assume that position and soon comments that Hibiki Sakurama seems very strange today. Trying to maintain composure, D addresses the man as Tokita-san. Although that's not how he usually refers to the veteran. Before the red could explode, Suzukiri intervenes and ends the argument but instructs her partner to return the letter. Thus, she gives it to Takeda to deliver, saying it's a great mission for the future Red Guardian, and the clown is flattered, inviting the girl to join his squadron. Suzukiri mentions she prefers the freedom at work that the Yellows provide, but Takeda argues that the Reds are specialists in exterminating monsters, and that should be every ranger's dream. He then asks if Sakurama agrees and de-recognizes each phase present from past battles. Before the fighter can respond, his yellow partner calls him to leave, and the disguised monster manages to depart from that threatening place without being discovered. On the way out of the headquarters, D admires his concentration in that delicate moment because he knows those rangers are powerful. Speaking of which, suddenly D comes across a poster revealing the name of the Red Guardian, Sase Akabane. Furthermore, the Guardian himself appears before him and stops in the corridor upon hearing his name mentioned. He can't believe such an important man would just stroll around seeing an opportunity for revenge, but once again, his companion pulls him away, thinking the boy's strange behavior is excessive idolatry. Before leaving, D compliments Akabane on his latest victory, but warns that one never knows the despicable tricks monsters can use. Having said that, the Guardian praises the new generation of recruits and leaves. Shortly after, Suzukura comments to Sakurama that she felt uneasy when he spoke with the Guardian. As the boy ignores her, she gets straight to the point and asks for the knife he has in his bag. With no way out, he tries to justify having the knife, but Suzukiri cuts him off before anything and reveals her true identity. He panics, but curiously, the ranger claims to have tried to cover for the monster all day, despite his slip-ups at the Red Headquarters, especially the terrible idea of advancing against the Guardian within his headquarters. D asks who this woman is, and she claims to be his enemy. With that, the fighter tries to react, but she destroys the monster with each attempt of his. After several defeats, he asks them to sit down and talk. Suzukiri then offers a joint job because she also wants to exterminate all the rangers. At that moment, the real Sakurama arrives, warning about a monster nearby, and D, having returned to his human form in time, is surprised that the rangers have such a problem today when it's not Sunday. Upon receiving the information, Suzukiri returns back to the monster, but it has already disappeared. Soon, Fighter F decides to rebel against the system, but facing the Red Squadron, he remembers he has no idea how to react to that alone. He fights for space in the crowd until he finds his friend running from the Rangers, until Tokita hits the Fuji's head and asks the small fish to stop regenerating uselessly. Having said that, F promises to return to his rightful place since he didn't find who he was looking for. However, Saucy Akabane never said at any moment that the monster could leave unpunished and plans to make an example of the fugitive with the other monsters. Using his power of transformation, the Red Guardian assumes his combat armor and draws the Divine Artifact, lamenting that the monster didn't want to hear what he just said in the Floating Fortress. Thus, the Guardian promises to bring true and definitive death to that immortal being, then invokes the Red Dragon Salamander through the artifact. Before being killed, the fighter already imagined this would happen. After all, he's just a humble monster. At least now, he understands why he rebelled, because even with the applause of the crowd, at the end of the day, fighters continue to be enslaved scum. After his last thought, the supreme technique Yamada no Orochi had pulverized Fighter F. Even after death, F's spirit had the chance to apologize to his friend D because he fought and lost. However, compared to the last 13 years of meaningless existence, today he felt good until his last breath. Meanwhile, D observes the smoke from the explosion fill in the air. Observing the scene of the tragedy, Sakurama questions in fear what kind of divine artifact this is, 
because it's different from any scene before. Attentive to everything, B recalls 12 years ago and the rangers climbed the floating fortress to warn the fighters that their leaders are no longer alive, therefore, they have two options, keep fighting until a ranger falls or make a deal to join forces with them. In the opinion of the Red Ranger, humans and monsters should unite to coexist. B gets angry at this memory and walks away without explanation, so Sakurama follows to see what's happening. Surprisingly, the ranger mourns the death of the fighter, if D knew him, so D turns and asks what this talk is about. Without ceremony, Sakurama warns that the monsters don't stand a chance, so B asks D to give up whatever he's planning. D questions how the ranger found out all this, and he explains that he overheard his conversation with Suzukiri while hiding. According to the ranger, even if the fight continues, justice will prevail, and the defeat of evil will come. This infuriates fighter D even more, who wants to know what justice this is, where monsters have been enslaved for 12 years to act in a foolish farce, and he promises not to give up his goal of destroying this corrupt human institution. Suddenly, Sakurama raises an admission paper and informs D that he passed the recruitment test, so he will finally become a ranger. According to the ranger philosophy, the world is indeed unjust, but we can all change it from within, fairly and honestly, to create a society where humans and monsters live together in absolute peace. After his speech, the young man extends his hand to D to solidify this harmony, who refuses the handshake and makes it clear that they are enemies and before disappearing from there, he says that Sakurama is not cut out to be a ranger. Anyway, G can't fight the system without help, so he seeks out Suzukiri, who imagined that the monster would return to her at some point. Proudly, D makes it clear that he only came to find out how to defeat the rangers and that he will discard the girl without a second thought afterward, so she shows that she's not moved by this tough talk by cutting the monster with a kitchen knife. Furthermore, she threatens to report him if he continues to insist on being so stubborn and arrogant, so when he backs down, she informs him that the key to defeating the rangers lies in the divine artifacts. There are five of them, which are transformation items for dragon guardians and give illusion powers to the user capable of destroying immortal monsters. Ranger force may seem strong, but it depends on the five best members, and a touch in the right place can destabilize the entire structure. Anyway, Dee remembers that the Guardians are always well protected, so it's not like they can be caught off guard while sleeping. On the other hand, Suzukiri teaches that at a certain point the Guardians set aside the Divine Artifacts in the Sunday Confrontation, because they can't bring real weapons to a performance. That said, soon Fighter D was striving to mimic the appearance of the Red Ranger, and Suzukiri asks why the monsters didn't do this before to spy on humans, and as the fighter takes too long, she asks him to turn into a chair. With that, D gets stressed and tells the girl to leave him alone. So he explains that he is capable of imitating surface beings, an ability that can change the course of this conflict. In a wild, already had the face of Sausi Akabane and was invading enemy territory. With Suzukiri giving instructions through the earpiece, he hears that he should go to a staircase to the right of the passage. He questions how she knows this, and she replies that it can be called feminine intuition. As the girl avoids answering all the important questions, D asks if she happens to be with the rangers, not understanding why she's helping the monsters, who are always ostracized by humanity. So she asks back if he has ever watched any teenage drama, where the cliché is to pair the nerdy girl with a rebellious hunk from school, and even if there is competition in the middle of the movie, in the end, they always end up together. Suzukiri feels bad because the protagonists always win, and that's why she wants to help the monsters. This pathetic comparison irritates Dee even more, but the only help he has is this individual who spews nonsense. So the deal is to move forward and nothing more. Finding lower-ranking Red Rangers soon after, he notices the prestige that Akabane has within the regiment and feels a taste of victory, as everyone believed he was the Guardian. However, as D reached the mentioned staircase, a small monster seems attentive to the disguised fighter's steps, who should find the divine artifact at the end of the stairs. However, all he sees is Shunto Kita, surprised by the quick return of the Guardian. D argues that he came to use the artifact to transform again, so Takita makes way despite sensing the suspicious smell of deceit. The clown comments that it's impressive for the Guardian to be willing to face that rabble every week, but any reason is enough to kill the monsters, and soon Suzukiri tries to keep the fighter focused on the mission. Even annoyed with the speeches, D manages to open the door and encourages Takeda to maintain the same mentality. Once inside the secret room, he finds it very ironic that the divine artifact is exposed as if it were a broom at Walmart, so he considers it a trap. But as arrogant as they are, the rangers don't see the monsters as a threat, so he grabs the weapon, while swearing to make the enemies regret their arrogance. However, Takeda returns and shoots the supposed Akabane in the head, attracted by the suspicious smell of the boss. D comments to the sniffer dog that if it were the true red, he would have died, but Takeda has a good point. If it were the true red, he would never fall for this surprise attack. 
With no way out, Eve threatens to attack the ranger, but he shoots the monster in the head with every step he takes, keeping the fighter in check. Despite the visible superiority, Takeda shudders at the regenerative power of this creature. But it's precisely the fear of dying that creates the need to evolve, according to the ranger. That's why humans stay on top without any sign of threat from the pathetic monsters, who until today are subjugated as slaves. Firing away, Takeda nearly loses his breath with satisfaction, while D nearly loses his head from having to restore it so much. With the fighter down, the human grabs the artifact to turn that monster to dust. He questions if just anyone can use this gadget, something Takeda doesn't know, but he's willing to find out right now. Thus, he begs for his life, surprising the human to some extent, but it's not just pleading that the fighter has to offer. Displaying a belt full of dynamite, D convinces the ranger to have empathy and drop the artifact for a civilized conversation. However, as Takeda knows all too well, monsters don't die, so detonating an explosive won't make D kamikaze, but it does make Takeda soaked in human flesh. Finally, he lights a match near the fuse to make the ranger feel the fear of death he so loves, and when Takeda tries to fight for his life, the fighter hits a golf club into the clown's processor, bleeding like any man until taking a second blow. Continuing his journey through the air ducts, Suzukiri praises the fighter's unknown strength every second as if he were a child after finishing everything on his plate and D is already fed up with this woman's arrogant attitude. At least he reaches the rooftop with the divine artifact as planned, but something that was out of the plans was the presence of the Red Guardian. So he asks him to stay out of the way because there are monsters in the arena for him to defeat. However, Akabane prefers to deal with the monster in front of him now, but not before the fighter D resists with the weapons he has. The Guardian plays around with the monster's inefficient resistance, but D doesn't give up until he takes his persistence to another level, knocking down a huge water reservoir with his seemingly out-of-battle arm. Remembering the good old baseball days, Akabane hits a home run on the huge sphere and sends it into space, and with the pipe he used as a bat, he tears off the monster's arm holding the artifact. D throws himself down the building to retrieve the weapon that can turn the game around, but he had to let his arm fall to save the chance of victory. Akabane praises the enemy's persistence, but sees that he's not even fit to be a supporting actor in villain's play. He thinks he's doing too well to be seen as garbage, but the Guardian laughs and says it doesn't make sense to kill a monster for nothing far from the cameras and the public, so this fight is paying off so much. Speaking of which, Tutuna TV station helicopter arrives at the scene to broadcast the Red's pursuit of the runaway monster, and now that millions of people are watching the fight, the Ranger can beat him up without holding back. To everyone's surprise, Akabane feels the injury suffered by the tiger monster last week and becomes vulnerable, until the rest of the dragon guardians show up to save the day. They ask if the red is okay, but he was actually just acting for his team's triumphant arrival. With everyone in position, Akabane gives the usual speech about the ranger's unity to save humanity from evil, while the yellow rejoices at being the last monster before going home. The Pink Guardian questions if it's the same fighter from last week rebelling again, and although the Red isn't sure because they all look alike, he decides to kill the enemy just in case with the Divine Artifact. However, the other Rangers think that resorting to this weapon every time is getting repetitive, and finally the Green has a different idea for the end of this show, offering to capture the opponent because it would be a waste to eliminate such great talent. The broadcasters transmit the surprise with excitement, but as the monster refuses the proposal on the spot, the Red also doesn't hesitate to order the opponent's death. Finally, the Blue Ranger activates the artifact and turns D into a ball of air that floats away with the wind. As he flies through the air, D remembers his comrade F bowing to the Rangers and therefore shouts that Akabane will at least remember him, but the Guardian replies that he won't and bursts the balloon with a snap of his fingers while striking his victory pose alongside the rest of the Dragon Guardians. With the end of the fight, the leader of the Guardians goes to retrieve the artifact while reflecting that he really needs to vary a bit in the endings of the shows. Suddenly, as he was about to retrieve his deadly weapon, Akabane discovers that it was actually the monster's arm disguised. Meanwhile, with the divine artifact in hand, Suzukiri laments the death of the brave D, but promises that none of this will be in vain because now there are only four artifacts left for the end of the Ranger farce. After this whole event at the Ranger Force headquarters, the Guardians gather in the sacred banquet hall, each with their junior representatives. Himura from Red, Aizone from Blue, Hizui from Green, and Naitishiko from Pink. The Pink Guardian wonders when the last sacred banquet took place, mentioning not only the presence of the first-tier veterans, but also the rookies. Consequently, they all plan a member change. Suddenly, the last participant, the Yellow Rookie, Yumeko Suzukiri, enters the room. Blue reproaches Yellow for not teaching his partner to apologize when she's late, so Suzukiri retorts that Blue behaves like a teenager in puberty because of his present companion. 
Lu gets angry and stands up to demand a different attitude from the woman, but Azum headbutts the boss and reproaches his rude treatment of others. The boss now turns against his junior until the Ranger Force mascot, Draggy, shows up questioning why everyone is fighting against their own friends, but Blue isn't interested in this chat right now. Finally, Sase Akabane, the Red Guardian, asserts authority and orders the chaos to stop. Then he asks Suzukiri what the procedure is when they do something wrong. Seething with anger inside, the yellow rookie apologizes for being late, and then the leader initiates the proceedings by revealing that he messed up. The other guardians exchange puzzled looks, so Ekabane explains that his divine artifact was stolen. Himura, his junior, questions if it's really true, so the boss reveals that the fighter he killed this morning must have taken it. Green mentions that he even forgot fighters could betray the rangers after 13 years of working together. Members wonder where the fighter could have hidden it, while Suzukiri considers that maybe he gave it to someone. Anyway, Red promises to bring down the hammer of justice on the offender once they start working with the fighters again, but his rookie questions the veteran's position after such a stupid and serious mistake. The Pink Guardian tries to intervene, but Hinamura maintains his offensive stance, stating that the artifacts are the ranger's pillar, so Ekabane should resign in the face of such an absurd failure. Just observing, Suzukuri finds it amusing how much of a fool that rookie is, especially since he was the one who leaked information about the divine artifact. To everyone's surprise, Akabane agrees with his junior about resigning, stating that due to Himura's sense of justice and effort, he should inherit this position. Proud of himself, Himura declares himself ready to take on this responsibility, promising to bring justice with all his might. With that said, Akabane presses the boy against the wall by the neck, asking what kind of strength that is, and before Red delivers the final blow to the rookie, Green tries unsuccessfully to stop him. Soon, Akabane invites everyone to return to eating once the problem is solved. Meanwhile, Blue reveals to Aizome that something is bothering him. Then scenes of D's death resurface, where Sakurama bet on the explosion that the fighter suffered to act. Analyzing the case with Hikiru, Blue believes that in the worst-case scenario, the fighter survived and took the artifact. If that's the case, two things could have happened. Either he was drawn back to the floating fortress, or the wind carried the monster elsewhere. Therefore, Blue will start by searching the fortress while Hikiru calculates the wind direction and tracks the fugitive. Meanwhile, D tries to recover after being violently exploded. Even after being saved by Suzukiri's explosives, the divine artifact shows its power by preventing the fighter's belly from regenerating. Nevertheless, even in the face of difficulties, at no point does he consider giving up his plan to conquer the world for his race. Seeing D crawling through the forest, Sakurama carries him to a safe place and claims to be willing to help his cause. He doesn't believe him and tries to punch the ranger, but the injury to his stomach prevents the monster from any effective reaction. Then Sakurama shows a first aid kit, but as the instruction manual involves decapitation in the process, he shouts that he's not desperate enough to accept help from a ranger. With that said, he tries to handle it himself by transferring part of his arm to close his belly, and after being scolded for looking at the most delicate parts of the monster's body, the human is fascinated by the surreal capability of his, while he demonstrates that his talent goes far beyond that by mimicking a cat on his own arm. Vain, the fighter tells the boy to make a request, so Sakurama asks him to mimic his face, and then asks for a replica of a fighter mask to pretend to be one. He takes offense at this and questions if the human can endure being exploded and walk around, but it seems that Sakurama can't do that. So the boy takes off the mask and reveals that he actually wants to learn more about the monsters because since he was a child, he has been committed to doing the right thing, like when he saved a kitten from a crow's claws. However, his father taught him at that time that crows also need to eat, and their lives are precious too. It was this sense of justice that Hibiki Sakurama always admired in his parents and sought to replicate as he grew older. Thirteen years ago, when the floating fortress appeared in the skies of Amanogawa, Hibiki asks his father if they will die, but his parents respond that everything is a gift from God, and these aliens may have come to correct the humanity's habits that consume the earth out of greed, but those who live a just life should not fear. On that evening, Sakurama would watch his older sister's mate training because his mission is to protect those who are precious to him, no matter the strength of the enemy. The sister emphasizes that this is the phrase of the Red Guardian, and that their parents don't let them watch the event because it's violent. In light of this, she is surprised by the little rebellion of the boy because he usually believes everything his father says. And indeed, even with their contradictions, Sakurama never stopped believing that his parents were right about everything. One day, when the boy was watching the Guardians, his father turns off the TV thinking they are a bunch of savages who provoked this war against the monsters with their weapons and hostility. As he didn't doubt the morality of his parents, little Hibiki accepted what they said without questioning. So one day, God descended to his parents' church, and in their belief, 
That was the sign that their prayers had finally been answered and salvation was on its way. Despite this, his sister tried to prevent the kid from entering the worship hall during the assembly and shortly thereafter, an explosion sent the whole room flying. When Hibiki went to see what happened, all the worshippers were dead in front of a monster disguised as God, who promised salvation to those who showed faith in him. At that moment, the monster caused another explosion in the room, and little Hibiki managed to escape death once again. But his sister ended up trapped under the rubble. The false god asked for forgiveness for the suffering he caused to the girl, then promised to end her pain. In the meantime, Hibiki tried to imitate his greatest idol, the Red Guardian, to save his little sister. But in the end, we all know there wasn't much hope. After Sakurama announced the end of the story, D complained that this story took longer than the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and that it would have leaked already if he hadn't been injured. The young man apologized and asked the fighter's real name, who claimed he would only reveal his identity over his own dead body, reminding him that he massacred that fake clown named Tokita. Sakurama was impressed and mentioned that he was the veteran of the 3rd Squadron, simply the 5th strongest member of the Red Squadron. Upon hearing this, the fighter filled with vanity, while the human recognized that he had underestimated the monster, and the two entered into a spiral of frantic admiration over this surprising feat. Until at the peak of the euphoria, the monster's final statement was that he, the mighty fighter D, would defeat humanity. Thus, Sakurama wrote down the fighter's name in his notebook and apologized for the mistake, but said he would do it again if it meant stopping this senseless war. Next, he was going to ask a favor from the monster, but Hikiru approached the scene, begging the damn monster to appear soon because he couldn't stand being covered in leaves anymore. Soon, Sakurama introduced himself as an independent ranger and informed that he had kidnapped a fighter, leading the Blue Squadron Ranger to the opposite corner of D. Sakurama spent as much time as he could stalling Hikiru, purposefully making wrong turns, but the Scythe Ranger showed that he would not tolerate any more mistakes of that kind. Suddenly, D. himself appeared in front of his pursuer and asked if he was a veteran, since he was from the 3rd Squadron, and as soon as Hakiru explained that he was one rank below, D. realized it would be a breeze to finish him off, so he called out the three down there for a showdown. Hikiru questioned who these three were, so he pointed to the back and attacked by surprise when the ranger turned to look. With the blow he received, the ranger was hurt for being deceived and started crying, mentioning that Tokita was killed because of such a dirty trick. Therefore, he activated his replica of the divine artifact, the blue dragon Leviathan, and when he realized that these replicas could also kill a monster, he fled from there without looking back. Hikiru threw the artifact's projectiles while he tried to escape even wounded, raging against Suzukiri for not telling about this weapon in the hands of the rookies. Anyway, he noticed that he would have to get rid of it alone, but the battlefield wasn't favorable, because the enemy devastated everything around that sinister weapon. However, the fighter took advantage of a moment of distraction from the opponent to steal his divine artifact, but when preparing to use the equipment, he burned the monster's hand and forced him to let go. Hikiru explained that he borrowed this power from the blue one, and that the power of this bond is what makes him fight so well. Always able to count on the veterans and rookies of his squadron, Ikiru affirmed that unity is strength, while melting along with his scythe. However, far from this meager discourse, D ran like never before to save his life, until he met Sakurama on the way and after some time, took him hostage to demand Hikiru's divine artifact. Hikiru considered that they might have swapped identities with the monster's ability, but as he didn't know the truth, he tried the only way to find out by approaching with the replica in his hand. Sakurama warned that he had asked for help from HQ, so they just had to hold on a little until help arrived, and Hikiru knew it wouldn't sit well to sacrifice a ranger to take down a monster, so he hesitated while his entire body melted. Soon he decided to leave the artifact behind, so Deke approached slowly until he threw Sakurama aside and tried to grab the weapon, but the Blue Squadron Ranger prevented it with his melted and boiling body mass, only to then run towards his replica. At the same moment, D used his own right arm for ambush to delay the boy, and when he finally got close to the weapon, Sakurama retrieved it for himself, then he cut off D's neck and ended the fight, but his right arm was regenerating like a monster's. Finally, the supposed Sakurama thanked his fellow ranger for his help and stated that this is the true power of the bond he was looking for, moving Hakiru. At the end of the cliff, the real Sakurama gradually recovered his form while celebrating that everything had gone well. Before being rescued by a helicopter, he formed the conspiracy with the monster that would result in this crazy strategy. First of all, he cut off his own arm and then asked D to follow his plan to the letter if he wanted to survive. So the fighter stated that he would destroy the ranger force first, while Sakurama replied that he would fix the ranger force before that. Meanwhile, Nadashiko informs Suzukiri that the pink and green squads are going to badmouth the Red Guardian and then throw a party. 
so he invites the representative of the yellow team. However, Suzukiri responds that she'll have to pass this time since she's going to watch the TV show she recorded. With that said, when the Pink Ranger passes by, Suzukiri remarks that her presence is useless there, and that actually Pink wants Sakurama. In response, Pink warns that if Suzukiri wants to level up, she should be less rude. Back to Sakurama, the independent ranger wishes luck to D, who is going to take his place in society. At the same time, the fighter hopes the human doesn't just die aimlessly out there and get him into trouble. Upon returning from his trip, he reflects on how he abandoned choices and almost lost his life, yet he doesn't even know who he should defeat yet. As he begins his life as Sakurama, he spends the night in the man's room and notices how noisy the place is. His disguise was perfect, but it still caused pain to the monster. Perhaps it's the scar left by the artifact's shot. Then D remembers Sakurama saying that a monster attacked him and his sister, and they were supposed to have died with their parents that day. However, the Blue Guardian saved them both and raised them after retiring like a true hero. This admiration fueled Hibiki's entry into the Ranger Force. With that said, he sarcastically remarks that in the end, the human found out it was all just a mere act. Indeed, Sakurama wanted to tell everything when he found out, but when he scheduled a press conference, he was attacked by unknown assailants. Because of this event, Sakurama doesn't know to what extent the Rangers are willing to keep their secrets, and he believes that his sister may be in danger if he continues investigating. Regardless, the man is willing to give up everything in pursuit of this goal. So until then, Fighter D needs to take his place in human society. D comments that ending a war is simple because it only requires defeating its enemies. As his leader used to say, monsters don't have the right to a full life, so they must reclaim planet Earth and live freely. At least that's the only way D knows to confront this situation. Sakurama asks what the monster intends to do after defeating the rangers and achieving this so-called freedom, but the harsh truth is that the fighter doesn't care about what comes after because his total focus is on defeating the dragon guardians along with the rangers. Trying to adapt to his new routine filled with gadgets he's never seen before, the monster lifts a notebook in an attempt to figure out what that noise is inside the device. Suddenly, someone knocks hard on the door, startling D, who drops the device, breaking it. At that moment, he remembers that Sakurama had described his relationship with all of his colleagues on a computer in the room, so D sees that everything has gone downhill. To try to recover the data, he begs a ranger to fix his PC. The ranger agrees but warns that this type of repair is not his specialty. To push it a bit further, the fake Sakurama asks the guy to check the noise in his room, and this time the blue one asks for a favor in return, giving some identities for the other to distribute among the independent rangers. Leaving the colleague's office, he considers him too good for a ranger, so he decides to annihilate him last during the revolution. Suddenly, another colleague arrives congratulating Sakurama for the good work, then he quickly checks the identities and sees that it's Yamato. D asks Yamato when they can leave there, but the other explains that it's impossible when training begins, so it's good to get used to underground life. Surprised, D asks to analyze the layout of the place and discovers that he's housed in a white dragon's nest. He asks how to meet the dragon guardian, so Yamato explains that the only alternative for an independent ranger is to win fights, survive, and be chosen by one of the five squads. Hearing this, D gets upset, thinking that Sakurama put him in a terrible position too far from his goal. In the meantime, Yamato continues, saying that he also dreamed of being a ranger, maybe even guardian and being flattered by the girls. However, people preferred Akabane and shattered his dream into pieces. Without paying much attention to his colleague's drama, he wonders if all the apprentices are like this. Then the ranger calls the supposed Sakurama to the cafeteria, where the others will be. Downstairs, he tries to deliver the document from Angelica Yukino, but the girl is stressed out and dismisses any interaction. On the other side of the table, Renrin Akebayashi complained that he looked terrible in the photo he took. Angelica loses patience and leaves the table, while Angel Yushikubo arrives and confesses that she wanted to get along with the ranger who got up. But it's certainly not possible since the two are competitors. Still, Renrin comments that despite what Sakurama said, he was the first to defeat a monster. Pretending to know what it's about, D throws some random topic about righteousness, making the girls wonder what's going on. After that, the disguised fighter hands over the identity to another Kali, this time Sojuro Ichikawa. Ichikawa thinks he looks too young in the photo they're using, as he's an old member of the organization and has aged. Nearby, Tsukasa Shippu calls Sakurama to work out tonight, but the fighter refuses. After that, D heads to another Kali to deliver another identity. However, as he was about to hand over to the respective owner, the boy almost hits him in the face, making it clear that no one should address him whenever they feel like it. This ranger's name is Kai Shayan, who takes his identity and walks away without giving any explanation to the knockdown colleague. He gets angry at that man's behavior, while Renrin warns that it's not a good idea to try to approach Kai at this moment. 
Moreover, when the fighter tries to retrieve the other identities, two more independent rangers show up to mess with Sakurama. Aigen Yurab thinks the redhead is too cocky after defeating the fighter, while Ramuru Komuga hands over his friend's ID without saying anything else. Before leaving, Red warns that Sakurama should stop spreading rumors that he's been talking to monsters. At this moment, D remembers that Sakurama said that all of his colleagues are cool, and so he understands his companion better thanks to how others see him. Anyway, the monster's target is the Dragon Guardian so he can't waste time with Small Fry, and he heads out to continue his mission. However, another colleague interrupts him, sporting the same deep green eyes as Sakurama and using a wheelchair. Connecting the dots, he realizes she's Ranger's sister, Cesara Sakurama. Unsure how to act, the monster invents an excuse and bolts from there. After reaching his room, D grumbles that idiot Hibiki didn't mention his sister was also a ranger. In the meantime, someone knocks forcefully on the closet door, so the fighter goes to open it, annoying only to find someone inside, startling him, causing him to run again. However, a sinister woman grabs the monster and recognizes him as Hibiki. He recognizes from the girl's arm that she's a fighter, and she asks Hibiki to set her free because she's tired of pretending to be a surface dweller. Suddenly, Cesara knocks on the room door, and Dee jumps to cover the woman's mouth, making him up to his sister that he's cleaning the room. The fighter is surprised by the ranger's hostile attitude, so Dee is confused about the woman's relationship with Sakurama. Therefore, he reveals he's a fighter, just like her. Then the girl apologizes for her behavior and reveals she's been trying to escape from this place for a long time. Meanwhile, Cesara keeps insisting on entering. The prisoner emphasizes that they have the numerical advantage, but Dee can endanger the ranger's sister. So he asks his new companion to hide and wait for his signal. Then he opens the door for Cesara, who asks her brother if he's ready for the final test, since it's against humble fighters who should be much trouble. At that moment, another noise occurs in the closet, so he tries to divert Cesara's attention to the apples she's carrying, convincing her to borrow a knife to eat. With the ranger's departure, the fighter grows impatient at not hearing her partner's signal, so he tries to manage both women at the same time without messing everything up. Cesar returns with a knife and accidentally throws it into the closet where the fighter is hiding while trying to cut an apple. He retrieves the stuck utensil and apologizes to his partner, who asks if this is an ambush. With that done, Cesar finally says what she came to say and asks her brother to give up being a ranger because it's not the right place for a pacifist like him. Before responding, Dee hears more and more knocks on the closet, perhaps because the fighter thought this conversation was the signal. Luckily for the monster, the girl's phone rings and she goes to answer it outside, while the fighter breaks the closet door and comes out wanting to deal with the situation with the ranger. Once again, Dee asks for calm because he has just arrived and doesn't know how things work around there. The woman freaks out upon hearing that the monster has recently arrived, which means he's a remnant, and she attacks him because she hates the fighters who chose to be enslaved 13 years ago, instead of those who fought to the end against the Dragon Guardians, from which only the fighter emerged alive in the end. Inside, D reflects that he actually went through horrible things in the floating fortress, but he has no intention of convincing the woman of that. Therefore, he stands up and pretends to agree with her strategy to attack the rangers, as long as the Dark One regains her human face. Taking advantage of her delay in remaking her face, D looks for something in the back and finds a box that will serve his purpose. So when the fighter finishes her transformation, he cuts off her head and puts it in the box just as Cesar returns to the room. Luckily, the Dark One manages to hide the body in the closet in time, explaining that the door is jammed because he put too much junk in there. With that done, the two resume their conversation and the girl invites her brother to live with her again, as it's dangerous to stay with the rangers. With the fighter's head between his arms, he explains that he came there to fight, so Cesara pulls out the knife and reminds him that the ranger force isn't as fair as Hibiki imagines because if he wants a just world, the young man must choose a different path than she chose for herself. Still, the fake Hibiki puts his wrist on the knife blade and assures her that he won't run away anymore and he won't turn a blind eye to what the rangers do. The sister reminds him that staying means having to face her at some point. Later, Natashiko asks her master how the reunion with her younger brother went, as boys that age grow so much in so little time. However, something catches the attention of Junior Rosa, causing him to stop the car. Back to D, he promises the fighter that he will win this war and regain the dignity of the Dark Ones, but the woman is not willing to forgive the man for what he did. By the way, she wants to know if Hibiki is alive and D replies that that guy doesn't die easily. Soon we see that Natashiko had stopped to help a woman surrounded by men. The pink guardian appears on the scene and initially startles them, but one of the men says that pink is just a pretty face for the guardians and convinces his friends to fight her. That immediately pink captures all the men at the playground, while reflecting that Hibiki really has grown a lot. In a conflict situation, Sakurama dashes across the battlefield and spots a woman with her daughter. He quickly alerts his companion that they must ensure the safety of the civilians, 
However, the rangers had already anticipated this and killed most of the monsters in the area because according to them, it's quicker to complete the mission by exterminating them all at once. Stack around the camp contain his discontent at the scene, secretly admitting to himself that he can't wait for the day he gets the opportunity to take on the Guardians. Suddenly, a fighter lunges at Sakurama, but before he can retaliate, Kai Shayan intervenes, executing a surprise shadow move, causing him and Sakurama to cross swords. With that done, the Overseer concludes the training for the final exam, and tomorrow will be the real deal. L confronts Kai, who got in his way, accusing him of trying to steal someone else's credit. Kai retorts that he doesn't need that since he leads by a long shot and kills. Returning to his dormitory, all the Shadow wanted was to get revenge on that ranger. Bringing up the subject, he asks XX if she had any news about Sakurama's exam. The girl demands that her real name not be easily disclosed, while Elle insists that their success in defeating the rangers necessarily depends on passing this test. He reflects alone that these guys are inconsistent in terms of strength. In his mind, the rangers who deserve more attention are Ichikawa, Yukino, Eikbayashi, and Yurei, while the rest aren't much. As for Kai Shayan, Elle vows not to lose to him. Exa comments that the fighter might get along well with these people, but that doesn't change the fact that they're monsters. Nevertheless, El knows this all too well because during his long ten years of humiliation, the surface dwellers made sure to remind him that the fighter is scum, and for that reason, all these humans are his enemies. The next day, the final exam begins, with the overseer dividing everyone into five types based on their training up to yesterday. The first will be the combat specialists, Team Pink. Team Green will be the stealthy ones attacking enemies from the shadows. The brains of the rangers will be in Team Yellow, while management specialists with an overview will form Team Blue. Finally, Team Red will be formed by monster extermination specialists focused on attack. L glances sideways at the other member of his team and presumes it will be a one-on-one -on -one to decide who passes. However, the Overseer announces that the groups will have to defeat five monsters, portrayed by active rangers, each holding one of five differently colored keys. Those who grab a key and escape the field may be considered by their respective squads. Facing this, Kai and L realize, unfortunately, teamwork is the way to go. Finally, the Overseer announces that candidates have three days using one of the Sunday confrontations as a reference, and they are all restricted to 30 minutes per day. At the end of the time, bells will ring to signal the end of the battle. With that said, the Blue Ranger announces the start of the test. Right at the beginning of the exam, Kai and L give different instructions on the first step, and L insists they should first hide to attack calmly. However, Kai doesn't think a Ranger should hide from a monster, so he prefers to confront them head-on. The big issue is that El can't suffer a single attack, otherwise his true identity will be revealed, so he wants to avoid direct confrontations. Unlike him, Kai Shayan claims he joined the Ranger Force to exterminate monsters, not to chat like Sakurama. Impatiently, El accepts his companion's suggestion, but Kai tells El to wake him up when he finds the monster. El reminds him they need to move in pairs, but Kai couldn't care less, in fact, he doesn't care about the exam at all. It's only I what's beyond this test. El mocks and comments that Kai wants to be one of those flattered in the Sunday confrontations until he breaks a sweat, noticing the sudden arrival of Suzukiri. She regrets not finding the yellow team, but nonetheless warns that it's a fierce monster that attacks anyone it sees. At this point, the teams realize that the actors portraying the monsters are first-tier rangers. El turns his back on Suzukiri because he needs to find the monster related to his team when, in front of him, appears Shun Tokita himself, still alive and completely patched up. Suzukiri remarks that two against two seems unfair for the independents, but Kai goes after the Yellow Ranger anyway. Suddenly, Kurusu appears with a truck and runs over the monster, but Suzukiri is more alive than ever behind the Yellow team, regretting that she won't be able to play with Sakurama for a bit. Meanwhile, the Green team hides. Elb goes after the Clown and Kai Shayan, who were facing off on the battlefield, until the third tier Red is disarmed. Then Kai mocks the fact that Tukita was beaten and humiliated by a mere fighter, thus bringing disgrace to the rangers. He attacks the rival as he says this, but Takeda reacts and hits Kai numerous times with force, incapacitating the independent ranger. Sakurama arrives at this moment and sees the sorry state of his partner. While the exam monster says they don't need to care about him after all, he's injured and defenseless. Despite this, Takeda insists that at this rate, the candidates will lose badly. The fake Sakurama stands still looking at the ranger, unsure of what to do, and the enemy comments that this behavior reminds him of the last time they played at the orphanage. And it seems the boy who only wanted to be a hero has finally grown up. L takes another look at Kai and realizes he will have to deal with this fight alone, but he still can't afford to be hit to avoid being discovered. Remembering the conversation with Sakurama, L had received a weapon from the rangers made by the Yellow Squad called the Dragon Device. Since he only had bad memories with it, L tried to break the thing. 
But now he had the device in his hands and used it against the Red Ranger, who fought back in the same manner. However, to everyone's surprise, Kai reacts and attacks Takeda once again, engaging in a new duel of laser swords. Takeda gains the upper hand again, while El notices a fire extinguisher on one of the columns and shoots at the enemy to distract him, then hits the extinguisher. With smoke covering the entire place, El calls for Kai to retreat and regroup, but the injured ranger refuses to take orders, especially since he needs to continue if he wants to earn an official rank. Otherwise, he won't be able to defeat that monster. El doesn't know what monster he's referring to, but Kai isn't in the mood for conversation, so he breaks free from his companion and goes after the enemy. Suddenly, El remembers listening to the radio with a colleague at the floating fortress, so he hears a brief smile. Then he tries to call Kai one last time to retreat, but as the boy insists on his attack, El runs away and says Kai can do whatever he wants after all, he doesn't even care about his companion. With that said, the two rangers engage in a duel, and Takeda continues to have the upper hand, disregarding the candidate's chances of passing the exam. Using his device, the clown almost hits Kai, and in the end fires in a car that explodes and isolates the independent even more wounded. This time, the Red Ranger approaches the candidate with all the freedom and begins to kick him in the face, wanting to know where all that bravado from a moment ago went. Meanwhile, a van approaches at high speed, along with another individual. Kai gets up again, almost powerless, and Takedo, who's about to finish him off, but the van arrives, smashing everything and ruining the plans of the Red Monster. With that, he grumbles that Hizui the Green Jr. interfered with him, but the Green argues that Takeda's guide was in the way, so he was dealt with. Right behind, the green team remains hidden, while Al questions whether Tokido will return to his monster role, because a monster wouldn't say that. After all, what matters at the end of the day is that you win, no matter how, because every winner is forgiven, and the losers turn to dust. Kanon Hizui is fed up because she just wanted to go home, but she still has to deal with those two. Takeda asks what Sakurama will do in the face of two monster actors, who happen to be 100 times worse than the real ones, but El doesn't seem scared at any moment and joins the green team to fight against the rivals. Angel Ikusubo was seriously injured and seemed like she wouldn't last long in combat, but she refuses to give up. For some reason, El asks each of his companions if they know how to draw. The two men say they're a disaster at it, and lastly, he asks the woman in the group. In the meantime, Hizu comments to Takeda that he got lucky because he's from the third tier and won't have to repeat this crap next year, but he assures her that by then he'll already be on the top shelf, then the candidates explode two more fire extinguishers, covering the surroundings in smoke again and further testing the veteran's patience. In the midst of the dimness, Hizui accidentally attacks Takeda, showing that they really have no idea where their targets are. A little further on, it's the Red's turn to attack the Green, but a smirk on the clown's face shows that maybe it wasn't unintentional. Earlier, Angel said she wasn't good at drawing, but El considers it a great attempt, considering they're in the midst of smoke. Then she asks what Sakurama will do with the drawing of those two in hand. Back to the present, the supposed Tokita tries to hit Hizui once again. And this time, the Green Junior loses her patience and fights back. Tokita has no idea what the woman is doing, but she's determined to get revenge on her subordinate. In the meantime, El turns the tables and this time tells Kai to stay in the corner and not interfere, and the Ranger even tries to get angry, but he's not even capable of that. El concludes by saying that he also doesn't fight alongside anyone, especially not with weaklings like Kai. Back in the midst of the smoke, Tokita had suffered a punishment from the Green Junior and was now injured, so El takes advantage and shoots him, focusing on the left side where he can't see. The Red Ranger struggles not to be at a disadvantage and manages to approach his adversary again, but El flees to the shadows once more and starts telling Kai to stay out of the fight because he'll be fine alone provoking his teammate to react. So when Takeda thinks he found Sakurama, a new extinguisher was destroyed on the ground and El's memories recall the radio, where two people acted contrary to what was ordered. With that in mind, El realizes that Kai has the same mindset, so he puts the ranger back into the fight by telling him not to do that. With numerical advantage, the red team starts turning the tide of the fight until Hizui resurfaces and finishes her revenge against Takeda, defeating him easily. Then she does the same with Kai and El realizes there's no way out now. The girl goes after the fake ranger and almost finishes him off, but Ichikawa manages to prevent the worst, and Angel joins the action, bringing down the Green Junior. Then El takes advantage of the fact that the Green team has regrouped against their monster and turns his attention back to Tokita. At the same time, Kai recovers and grabs the legs of the red monster, giving room for the fighter to land a solid blow on his enemy. Tokita complains that the head doesn't count, but El couldn't care less. 
However, the bell rings and decrees the end of the first day of the exam, leaving the final moment for later. Soon returning to a safe zone, Yukino is furious about the situation they'd just been through because she joined the rangers to fight monsters, not those guys. Meanwhile, Angel Yusukubo falls weak, questioning if he'll be able to endure two more days in this situation. Arrogant as ever, Kai Cheyenne tells the weaklings to go home since they're so afraid. Yureb can't shake off the monstrous appearance of that ranger who appeared to him, Komashi Aizom. Then he summons Ramoro to return to their quarters because they need to have a meeting. L comments that those two are always together and Yamato reveals that they're childhood friends. In another corner of the room, Renrin complains that Shippu said he hadn't trained enough so he locked himself in the training room. Suddenly, L sees Fighter XX running through the ranger installation corridors so he was after her before a tragedy occurs. Kai calls the guy and tells him they need to talk, but the fake Sakurama had already mentioned he was in a hurry, and now he needs to find Fighter as soon as possible. After a while, Etta finds XS making noise with the pipes and pulls her back to her room, telling her to return to the fortress while shoving her into the closet. After doing that, he returns to Kai, who asks if the Sakurama in front of him is the one who talks nonsense about reconciling with the monsters, or if it's the one he saw during the test because only by knowing the truth can they work together tomorrow. Speaking of which, when the bell rang to end the first day of the final test, Tokita and Kai continued grappling on the ground even with the ceasefire warning. The clown was getting the upper hand until L intervened with his sword, because despite how his partner acted, they're still a team. Takeda doesn't like this idea of team that the young man keeps talking about, while Kai mentions that the key is on the back of the Red Ranger's belt. Kanon Hizui shows up to put an end to the nonsense, and she takes the clown away with her. L reflects that there was only one key, and if Takeda is telling the truth, each one needs one. Thus, it would be a battle between the two members of the same squad, in other words, L versus Kai Cheyenne will decide between themselves who passes. For the sake of everyone, the fighter promises to crush Kai's dreams. Meanwhile, upon arriving at Sakurama's room, the ranger who was supposed to fix his friend's closet saw that the hole was irreparable, so he removes the door to replace it. However, he finds XS inside and even cuts the girl's hand, who is defenseless against the enemy. Cornering the opponent, the man asks her not to resist and to stay quiet and she is sure that this is her end, but the man deactivates his laser sword and states that he will help her escape. Exes is suspicious and warns that she won't fall for that, and the human laughs as he explains that he even joined the ranger force but was never a fan of fighting, so he took on the maintenance position. Returning to the fake Sakurama, he tells Kai that 13 years ago, he and his sister were in danger when a monster named Deuce attacked everyone, but the Blue Guardian saved them. That's why Hippiki wanted to join the rangers. Kai asks more about this so-called monster Deuce, and L feels is going wrong because he only knew how to tell that story up to that point. So he improvises and says that it all happens suddenly, so he's not sure. But it seems to be one of the leaders. Having said that, Kai reveals that he has scores to settle with him, because they killed his older brother. Although he was a ranger, the brutality of the leaders is much higher compared to the Dark Ones, so Kai couldn't do anything but watch his brother being mercilessly crushed. However, he put this past a weakness behind him, vowing to bury his opponent with his own hands, whoever it may be. Listening to every word, L reflects that this is why Kai is so reckless. It's this desire for revenge that drives his actions. L understands this feeling very well, and he knows that this whole motivation will be against him when the two finally have to face each other. To try to spare the monster, L considers that perhaps this leader has already been defeated by the Guardians, but Kai obsessively watched the Sunday confrontations and never saw any records of this creature. For some reason, only incompetent leaders emerge in this event. Kai needs the real bosses alive so he can fulfill his four-year-old revenge. Surprise, El asks if his brother didn't die 13 years ago because the Guardians defeated all the monster leaders at that time, but his partner reaffirms that this scar is more recent. And it was this disbelief that the leaders still existed that made no one believe Kai Shine's testimony about the death of his older brother. In short, L found out that there are probably still monster leaders somewhere, and at first he thinks of asking XX if she knows anything about it. Meanwhile, she is being convinced by the Blue Ranger that there is a peaceful way to resolve this matter until an energy shot hits the man's rib and ends his life. At the door of the room, XX notices that it is Lord Peltrola, also known to some as Deuce, responding to a distress signal that the Dark One sent through the pipes. She feels honored to have been rescued by a leader personally. Peltrola regrets that his dear XX was forced to be trapped in this lamentable situation, just like him. He remembers that XX, before dying and ascending to heaven, left a phrase saying that war is tragic it shouldn't exist in this world, wishing for a peaceful world where we don't have to resort to violent means. Hearing this, the girl trembles with fear and prays for L to undo his impersonation and escape as soon as possible. 
Speaking of L, he thinks that the expectation of the fight between him and Kai is becoming more exciting, especially now with the weight of the young human's family drama. Just to see his companion's angry face, the Dark One plans to betray him at the last minute he can. So he asks XX if she doesn't find this idea fun, but no one answers. On the second day of the final exam, fake Sakurama is grumbling about his partner's delay while watching Ichikawa and Yamato chatting about something as Ramaru struggles to climb the stairs. L notices that things are going south for him. Just then, Blue Jr., Komachi Aizome, asks if Sakurama is the one from the Red Squadron that Izui mentioned. The fighter is taken aback, but the girl reassures him, explaining that she already lost her key, so she can't fight anymore. According to her, the Blue Squadron recruits did a great job as a team and managed to recover the key. Speaking of which, she emphasizes that Sakurama will need his partner to win this phase and therefore it will be difficult to face him after forming this kind of bond. However, El has the nerve to confess that after they defeat the monster actor from the Red Squadron, he'll make up an excuse and hide. After all, he's not like the Junior's colleagues who pretend to be allies of justice. Besides, he's the only one fighting there who's putting his life at risk, and everything he does there could decide the fate of his comrades in the fortress. Next, El encounters Cheyenne and Tokita fighting, while Renrin, Yureb, Ichikawa, and Angelica join forces to confront the Red Monster actor. Takeda manages to fend off the new opponents, but Kai ends up taking his key amid the distraction. L asks Kai what he thinks he's doing bringing all these people, and he replies that this exam is a key battle within the same squadron, so he's going to join these four and abandon Sakurama. L is outraged by his ex-comrade's attitude, and Takeda finds it amusing, as humans cannot be defeated by monsters, so only the top five rangers are selected to become guardians. Outside the Chosen Ones, Yamato and Angel lament with L about being discarded. The fighter plan to betray the ranger, but can't stand seeing the opposite happen. Faced with all this, Angel suggests that they join forces too to retrieve the keys that have already been taken, and L finds this proposal quite interesting. So he goes to fetch the last ranger who was left behind, but the blue one is absolutely sure that all effort will be futile, considering that those five had the highest scores in training. L tries to uplift the boy, saying he's only lost once, but this phrase triggers something in the ranger, who struggles with memories from his childhood and lashes out at Sakurama. Seeing this, L lets his true identity be revealed to convince the boy that losers can unite to try a different fate, and this time, Ramaru Koguma joins the group. Soon after, the others warn that the opposing team has already moved on to the fourth battle. The third one was the pink one, and now it's green. Therefore, the last one will be yellow, guarded by Suzukiri. So they skip straight to Yellow Jr., which has three opponents, unlike the five from the other team of rangers formed in the competition. Sakurama tries to prove that having fewer members doesn't put them at a disadvantage, and since the woman refused to hand over the key, they shoot at her. However, she remains unscathed even with the shots until Ramaru's surprise attack hits the opponent head-on. Still, the shield around the ranger keeps her intact, so recruits begin to realize that nothing they've done so far has mattered at all. But since there's little time left until the end of the second day, they give it their all for a final push for victory. Suzukiri scoffs at the shots absorbed by her shield, so the rangers drop their weapons and go for hand-to-hand -hand combat against the opponent. Angel is too weakened and doesn't even make it to the melee. Next, the monster actress makes a point of pushing past the others to grab Yamato's face, precisely because he keeps hiding behind the others. For this reason, she calls him a coward in every possible way, stating that he will never be a hero, tossing away whatever self-esteem he had left. El reacts and pulls the woman away from his companion, Emphasizing that anyone can be a guardian and even very bad people can be considered heroes, throwing a clear hint. Suddenly, Yamato decides to give his all in the fight, but Suzukiri interrupts the combat and decides to hand over the key to the group because she's eager to see someone like Yamato become a guardian, as she just heard that anyone can be one of them. Finally, she asks what each of their intentions is after becoming official rangers, and Elle lets slip that it's world domination. While his partners don't understand anything, Suzukiri jokes that she'll root for this ranger. Then she leaves, hoping that the fighter will get the remaining four. After the victory, Elle suggests that the group be called the Evil Monster Army, but the others don't seem very keen on being hated by the public. Regardless, the bell is about to ring, so they decide to leave this matter for later. However, Angelica and Yuraev show up to take Yamato's key, and Elle doesn't let it slide, retaliating with his sword. Angelica makes it clear that this is a competition to determine who's on top and who's on bottom, and they certainly don't want to be the latter. Speaking of which, the bell rings, declaring victory for the first group. Meanwhile, Lord Peltrola walks through the ranger installation wondering how many inhuman experiments have been conducted in this place and therefore he should save everyone's soul. 
As they pass through the corridor, the monsters leave a dead blue ranger in their wake, while Komachi follows the invader's footsteps. With the bells ring, the victorious rangers personally taunt Karusu, who messed up by holding the key and allowing the rivals to snatch it. Angelica tells the guy he only joined the ranger force to try to impress women, so he's nothing but a vain coward. Meanwhile, Angel keeps count like a clock. Fake Sakurama makes a point to approach the winners and congratulate them on their victory, admitting his own defeat, but he's just using this speech to steal a key back. As the other members of the first team arrive, Yuraid questions the leader, Kai Cheyenne, if it's cheating to grab the key after the bell rings. However, Kai explains that the second day isn't over yet. Yuraid mentions the bell ringing, but no one besides him and Angelica heard any sound. So they look at the second team and realize the rivals scheme something. The forgotten team wastes no time and dashes in the race, pursued by the most promising candidates of the exam. Earlier, L asked Ramar to tweet the signal to go off earlier because the guy knows his way around that equipment. Aware of this, Angel volunteers to be some sort of timekeeper, giving the signal right on time. Sometime later, the plan had been set in motion, and now they need to find a way to delay the pursuers, so Ramaru and Angel stay behind and send the remaining members ahead with the escape. Despite the effort, Kai isn't stopped by the opponents and manages to keep his run, and the ranger is fast enough to catch up with the opponents in no time. Knowing this, Yamato Kurusu asks for the key and swears to protect it, so Sakurama entrusts the victory to that man. With that done, the group's priority is to protect the key holder, and in the midst of the confusion, Sakurama and Kai Shayan end up grappling and starting a fight. Ishikawa gets a view to hit the opponent carrying the key, and Sakurama even manages to hit his leg in time but the poorly aimed shot ends up hitting Karusu's hand, dropping the key. Following the ranger by his side, Angelica and he jump at the same time to reach the coveted object, until the final bell finally rings, ordering the end of the fights. With that, Ramaru and Angel celebrate the sound of the bell, while Karusu holds the key as if it were his newborn baby in danger. Sakurama decrees that everyone should prepare for tomorrow because all the remaining four keys will be theirs. In another corner of the base, Lord Peltrola continues his path among the corridors, threatening another Blue Ranger. The monster was about to hit the human when Azom saves the girl in time and sends her to flee. However, the Ranger doesn't want to leave her comrade alone in this fight, so Peltrola smashes her head without hesitation. Incredulous, Azom questions what a leader like him is doing there. Without answering, Peltrola returns with another question, wanting to know if the rookie is the big evil causing conflict in this place. Azom says maybe she is, so the entity humiliates the girl, saying her position doesn't match her stature, and that she's not as young as she seems. Seeing the texture of her skin, the god presumes she's struggling with the pressure of responsibility, and to maintain her current appearance before it deteriorates, he demands the ranger to kneel. She's not willing to surrender, affirming she'll still be beautiful even when she's old. With that said, she manifests Yumabozu, her divine artifact. Without lifting a finger, Peltrola finds this reaction quite foolish, while the huge explosion engulfs the entire corridor. Back to the exam winners of this night, Sakurama and the others thank Ramaru for managing to readjust the device, and since the Blue Ranger is so skilled, Karusu asks why he doesn't join the Yellow Squadron, while Karusu himself swaps colors with his companion. Angel says she'd be pretty happy in the Green Squadron, while Sakurama acknowledges they would fit well as Dragon Guardians. Speaking of them, Angel asks where Shippu is, the muscle head of the Pink Squadron, since today is the second day and he still hasn't shown up. So she and Kurusu decide to go after the last member of the team, leaving the rest behind. Now that they're alone, Ramaru asks if Sakurama is really Sakurama, wanting to know why a fighter is there. All threatens the companion with death, but Ramaru doesn't believe the fake Sakurama is truly capable of killing him. With that said, he asks L to finish what he needs to do and then rejoin the group. Shortly after, the team finally finds Shippo, who's in a corpse-like shape and deliriously philosophizing, saying his strength is that of an ant. And no matter how many ants gather, they're not altogether capable of facing a dragon. Despite the strange downfall of their companion, Ranmaru emphasizes that he assembled a very resilient team. For example, Angel Yusukubo overcame the pain of the serious injury and fought against a feared rookie. Besides her, Yamato Kurusu is incomparable when it comes to escaping, being primarily responsible for recovering a key for the team. Finally, none of this would be possible without Sakurama's help, and that's why the Blue Ranger promises to protect him, no matter who he is. And it's for these reasons that they want Shippu to complete the team, because together they can ensure this victory and pass the exam. Feeling less defeated, Tsukasa Shippu even prepares his bench press to get back in top form, but still, he doesn't believe he'll be able to reach the imposing shape of the pink rookie, Masaru Natashiko. However, his partners warn him that he won't have to face the rookie, 
because the key is with the elite team. These words fit like a glove in the ears of the Pink Ranger, who regains his original muscularity and promises that there are no opponents for him from now on. Meanwhile, Sakurama watches Ishikawa consoling Angelica for losing the key, giving a sly hug to the woman who blames herself so much for the defeat. Curious, Ranmaru questions Kurusu if his talk about joining the Yellow Squad was serious. When his friend confirms it, he remembers his childhood alongside Yureb and says he'll talk to the instructor. On the way, he encounters L and thanks him for helping him discover his talent. Inside, the fighter finds it amusing, as he's just using those guys until he sees Kurusu walking alone down another corridor. In that moment, Ramaru reflects that Yureb is like a hero to him, but now he has decided to be his own hero. Mid-thought, he sees Aizom in danger against two monsters, so he flees in fear. The freshman tries to escape by calling the elevator, but Peltrola hits her once again, following his desire to save his lost sheep one by one, starting with her. Suddenly, Ramaru arrives with a flying kick and positions himself in front of his companion as the elevator arrives. Aizom tells Ramaru to leave, but the boy throws her into the elevator, which closes. Alone against the two threats, Ramuro Koguma recalls that he joined the ranger force precisely to defend the weaker ones, and with that in mind, he attacks Peltrola. The monster retaliates, but not before receiving a sword blow from the enemy, surprised to have been injured by someone so inferior to a dragon guardian. The god plans to isolate himself in a corner until he recovers from the damage, leaving the cleanup to his subordinate Extax who observes Ramuro extremely weakened on the ground. Meanwhile, El overhears a conversation between an ally and an enemy, where Ishikawa invites Kurusu to join his team in place of Angelica Yukino. Kurusu is very excited to join the elite group, but he reminds the rival that this key he was about to hand over belongs not only to him, but also to his comrades who helped him get it. Ishikawa argues that this would be the guy's chance to join the official ranger force, and he agrees once he will win the competition and be promoted. That said, Stakurama reveals himself congratulating his comrades' loyalty and praising the opponent's attempt. Soon Kurusu leaves, while El reflects that he needed dumb people on his team like that guy. Some time later, the other freshmen investigate the blood spread throughout the base, imagining it to be Izomes. So they set an emergency signal to HQ, that is, if the transmission is working, since the visitor doesn't want to allow contact with the leadership. Faced with the facts, Suzukiri considers postponing the test for now, but Canon Hizui reminds them that the newcomers can't know about any of this, as it's a confidential matter. That said, Tokita announces the opening of the hunting season for the god. Back in the reject route, Shippo assures them they don't need to be afraid anymore because he's here to solve the problem with his strength of a hundred men. Doing the math, he informs that they are 105 against 5, meaning a considerable numerical advantage. Angel points out that they are now 104, but the last member returns from the ashes after facing Peltrola. Then the two teams meet again, and Ishikawa reminds them they have four keys, while the opponents have only one. So whoever gathers the five first wins, Sakurama suggests one-on-one -on -one fights using the dragon device but without cheating. Yurab finds it ironic that this guy is talking about cheating. Apart from that, he goes after his friend, Ramoro, saying he hasn't abandoned him, as the two must prepare to face each other. For the green squad, Ishikawa asks how Angel's leg is, and she affirms it's fine. Finding it strange that Ishikawa helped her walk on the day of the injury, even though she already considered her companion an enemy. Ishikawa is a simple man and would love for Angel not to complicate things and surrender, but Angel didn't like being underestimated. In the Red Rivals, Sakurama accuses Kai Shion of betrayal, saying it could make him a monster. But Kai claims he has his reasons to give everything he can and become a ranger, unlike the opponent. Then Sakurama goes further and says that the incident with Kai's older brother wasn't the work of a leader because they have already been extinct, and the ranger gets angry at seeing his brother mentioned by the enemy, promising to prove the existence of the leaders. Then El draws his sword, emanating a powerful energy wave, surprising Kai. Earlier, Angel had passed on to him a discovery by Ramaru when dismantling the alarm device. A new form of weapon perfect for short-range combat called Explosive Form. With it, the fighter keeps the opponent on the defensive against such power. After intensely shielding against the sword, Cheyenne has the idea to fire at his smoke chamber, covering his opponent and leaving him vulnerable to long-range shots. Afraid of being fatally hit, Sakurama delivers a forceful blow that destroys the ground, knocking down the opponent and subduing him. Then the fake ranger tries to force the enemy to admit that he blamed the leader monsters just because he couldn't deal with his brother's loss, but Kai responds that he has heard this nonsense forever. When he was younger, he was despised by the Red Guardian, who didn't believe when little Kai assured that a leader of the monsters killed his brother. 
In response, the ranger says that the boy's brother was never fit to be a ranger, so much so that he actually died to a weak fighter. For that reason, Kai Shaya not only promises revenge against the leaders but also against the ranger force itself. Upon hearing this, El sees himself in that man at the same moment but still knocks him down again. Years ago, his brother, Riku Shayan, had passed the test to become a ranger on the same day he gave a present to his youngest. Riku intended not only to have the monsters as enemies but also all the injustice of this world. Now Kai strikes his saber against a stone, trying to make it work, angry for losing in such an unjust way. After one last strike with all his might, he accidentally activates a device similar to Sakurama's explosive form. With that done, now the rivals were on equal footing, and if you enjoyed this anime and want to see more of it, go ahead and hit that like button down below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Every subscription counts and helps us grow our community. Catch you next time.